Sean, Brendan, and Patrick were born within minutes of each other at a hospital in Pennsylvania. Their parents had prayed and prayed that God would give them children. And for a number of years, it seemed that their prayers were not answered. But then they received the good news. They were pregnant. And as mom and dad celebrated, their doctor had to interrupt and say, but wait, not only are you pregnant, you're going to have triplets. Their prayers had been answered, but they also learned an important lesson about prayer. It helps to be specific. Perhaps they should have prayed, Lord, please send us one child at a time. Through Christ our Lord, amen. Well, you can imagine the controlled chaos of that home in the next few years. Three red-headed Irish-American boys growing up at the same pace, in the same place. And the three little boys were, were pretty good at sharing. But occasionally they got into fights about whose toy this was or whose socks those were. One day I, I went over to visit and two of the boys were playing with their trucks on the floor. Then an argument broke out and Brendan said, give it to me, that's my fire truck. And Sean responded, no, it's not, it's my fire truck. Now at my house, when my brother and I were growing up, these arguments usually ended up with my brother and I calling each other non-Christian names and wrestling until somebody got hurt. But not so for Brendan and Sean. Their mom didn't even raise her voice. She simply said, whose name is on the truck? And the boys stopped and they turned over the truck and there in black magic marker was the name Sean. The boys looked at the name on the truck and then Brendan politely handed the truck to his brother and said, here, Sean, this is yours, your name is on it. And they went back to playing. Their mom explained that she did this with everything, every pair of underwear, every coat, every toy. They were all clearly marked with a name. So whenever a question came up, it was clear. Just look at the name that's on it, and you'll know who it belongs to. Frankly, I think that's a great survival tool for the mother of triplets. But I also think it's one of the insights that Jesus reveals in today's gospel. As the Pharisees and the Herodians try to plot how they could entrap Jesus, Jesus won't be drawn into their plotting he simply says, look at the coin, whose face is carved on it, and whose name is inscribed there. That's who it belongs to. And with that answer, the argument ends. Let's pull the lens back and see the big picture today. For the past few Sundays, we've been encountering Jesus in a section of Matthew's Gospel where there is violence afoot and tension in the air. Today's passage happens in that section of Matthew's Gospel where Jesus has already entered Jerusalem on what we call Palm Sunday. He rode into the holy city on that donkey, hailed as the Savior and King. This made the religious and political leaders nervous. So nervous that they unleashed their plot to kill Jesus. While the leaders plot, Jesus is busy in Jerusalem, turning over the tables of the money changers in the temple, healing those who had been told that they were unworthy, challenging his listeners with parables about vineyards and wedding feasts, parables that do not sugarcoat God's word. Jesus makes it clear that every human action has consequences, both here and in eternity. 
His teaching is spellbinding. So much so that various factions within Jerusalem, folks who would not speak to each other, are now united in one purpose. We have to get rid of this Jesus. Don't miss that little detail which is provided by Matthew as today's encounter begins. Matthew tells us that Pharisees and Herodians came to Jesus to ask their, their trick question. Now remember, the Pharisees were seen as defenders of the dream of a free and independent Israel. The Herodians, on the other hand, were Jewish people who were fully cooperating with the Roman occupying powers. So you have those opposed to the occupation and those cooperating with the occupation all in agreement on one thing. This Jesus is dangerous. So they devise a, a trick question. If Jesus says that it's okay to pay taxes, then the Pharisees can publicly denounce Jesus as, a, as an enemy of the people. If Jesus says it's not okay to pay taxes, the Herodians can denounce him as an enemy of the government. Pretty slick, huh? Now, remember the question they asked. Is it okay for us to pay the emperor's tax or not? But remember, the religious leaders really don't care about the answer. They're simply trying to get Jesus to say something that they can use to get him into trouble. They have set up the argument and they're waiting to pounce. Jesus asks them to show him the coin that's used to pay the emperor's tax. And Jesus very calmly asks, whose head is on that coin and whose inscription in other words, Jesus is asking, whose image is, is stamped on the money you use to pay the tax, and whose name is on that coin, along with the list of his royal titles? Jesus asks the question, whose name is on that coin? And Jesus has changed the conversation. There will be no fight here. If it has the emperor's name, Caesar's name on it, give it to Caesar. If it has God's name on it, give it to God. Once again, Jesus refuses to answer a hypocritical question based on the ground rules of his questioners. Jesus challenges everyone. Jesus has given an excellent answer. So far, so good. Except, except some people have turned Jesus' excellent answer into an excellent excuse. I once had a conversation with two rather powerful people. One was a woman who was a politician. The other was a very successful businessman. They both spoke honestly about the moral dilemmas that they faced every day, how they were constantly tempted to cut corners, to tell lies, to betray trusts, to go against their word, to do sinful things in order to succeed. And both basically admitted to me that, that although they went to church on the weekend, they found it almost impossible to put the gospel into practice Monday through Friday in their work. In order to succeed, they said, they had to play dirty. That's when the man said to me, so, I guess I give to Caesar Monday through Friday, and I give to God on Sunday. Which is, of course, a kind of excuse. But it is not excusable. 
and it is certainly not what Jesus had in mind as he spoke to the Herodians and the Pharisees. When Jesus said, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, give to God what is God's, he was not giving us permission to live compartmentalized, divided, hypocritical lives. He was not telling us that God gets this much of our lives and the real world gets the rest. Christ always calls us to be women and men, teenagers and children who have integrity. Recall again how Jesus settled the argument. He said, look and see whose, whose image is on the coin, whose name is inscribed there. So when I was having that conversation with that businessman, maybe I should have asked him, in whose image were you created? Whose image do you bear? And whose name was poured upon you when you were baptized? The coin belongs to Caesar because his image is on it and his name is on it. But you, you Christian people, you belong to God because you are created in the divine image and God's name, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, was forever imprinted on you in the waters of baptism. You belong to God, all of you, every part of you, every aspect of you, every action of you, every decision of you. We often start prayer reminding ourselves of the name that we bear. We often pray in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. God's name is on you because you belong to God. Christ's cross is marked on you because you belong to Christ. God's image is deep within you. You belong to God. Now, I don't know what temptations you will face this week. I don't know what struggles you will have, what corners you might want to cut, what compromises you might want to make. I don't know where it will be hardest for you to live the gospel this week, whether at home, at work, at school, at play. I don't know how you have tried to divide your life. I don't know if you try to live without Christ all week long and then say that you're worshiping him at church for an hour or so on the weekend. And I don't know if you have lost sight of the fact that you bear the image of God. When we forget that the image and name of God are inscribed in us, it becomes easier for us to allow all of the Caesars of this world to lay claim on us, to demand our obedience, to require our sacrifice and our worship. There are so many people and things in this world who want to rule your life. They want all of you. I don't know how or if you are worshiping Caesar. What I do know is this. The next time you're tempted to do the wrong thing, Stop and remember, you belong to God. You bear his image and his name. The next time you feel pulled to compromise your gospel values, stop 
you belong to God. You bear God's image and God's name. And the next time you're being led down a path headed towards what is sinful, stop. You belong to God. You bear God's image and name. If you're tempted to sell out, to lie, to cheat, to do what's wrong, to say what's wrong, to live what's wrong, stop. You belong to God. You bear God's image and God's name. You don't have to be a red-headed Irish kid to figure this out. When it feels like evil is fighting against you or trying to divide your life, stop. Look at the name written on you at baptism and remember, you belong to God, all of you, every part of you. You belong to Christ. So give like it and live like it.